Um, and that's where we can really dig into it. But this will kind of give you what it looks like and why you might use it. And then our follow-up support for Hapara, and then we do have certifications for this one. We get a lot of questions about that, so we thought we might put the information on here quickly and then answer your questions moving forward. So for the teacher dashboard, this is kind of some topics that we're gonna cover today um, in terms of the dashboard and smart share and the folders and everything, but we're not gonna be sticking to the slide deck. You do have access to it for reference. And again, the questions are on most slides here that you uh, might be in. So please ask those questions during the, uh, during the whole session if it pops up. So at the end we can uh, address them. But for now, we're gonna kind of uh, move away from the, the slide deck and move into the live environment, just so uh, that's what we came here for. So how do we access the both Hapara? Well, I'm sure you've seen it on the staff portal. We see both the icon, dashboard, and workspace. If you click on the icon or dashboard, it brings you to dashboard. If you click on workspace, it will bring you to workspace. So for today, I'm just gonna click on um, dashboard to bring us into the environment. So when, when you log in, um, you should see all the classes that uh, you currently teach that are enrolled in PowerSchool. For myself and the consultant team, we uh, don't have any classes enrolled in PowerSchool being at the, the system level. So we have some fake sandbox accounts. So you'll see CEC training one and two and three and four. Um, you will see uh, your classes with your school code and your class code and the year and so forth. So that would be something you would look for. Um, these being four classes aligns kind of nicely for maybe if you have four blocks in a day or four subjects. These are obviously your teaching subjects, but they are all in blue and they all kind of look the same except for the name of the uh, title of the class. So you might want to uh, maybe personalize that a little bit for yourself when you come in and maybe visualize, uh, make it easier for yourself to notice it. So CC Training 1, I'm going to stick with this class today. If I click on uh, the little uh, pencil, it is an edit button, and maybe I wanted to switch the color out of the blue. So you do see some options up here. There's not too, too many of them, but there's a good enough to uh, give you a variance. And I'm going to click on this, and I'm going to make it yellow. Um, I'm thinking yellow right now. It just might be something that it corresponds uh, coming from elementary. We have that literacy document that is yellow, so I'm going to call this language arts. And if I click on save, it's now yellow and it's uh, language arts. Um, so that helps me a little bit um, when I'm coming in to the dashboard and I want to click on that class. I can do this to each of the other ones and rename them as I'm needing it to. So this is just for the teacher piece of it. It's not really affecting um, that piece of it. So some people also say, well, I teach a lot of courses or it's semester, that type of thing. And I just kind of want to move some of these out of the way uh, moving forward. And so these little stars are favorite buttons. You do see that same option in actually Google Drive and it, it is helpful to navigate that. But let's say CC training three is another subject that I don't want. If I click the star and it goes away, you will see that it's unchecked right now. It says the this class will no longer show in my classes, but it's still there. So in Hapara, um, it is good sometimes to uh, refresh um, the screen and there are other refresh options that I'll show you as we navigate. As I come back in, you will see that CC Training 3 is now not on my initial dashboard under my classes, but sometimes this is an accident. You may fret, where did it go? Under all classes, it's now there, and you can see that it's unchecked. Uh, and if I click it, and then I click back onto my classes, and likewise, you could just click to all classes as opposed to refreshing the page, it's now there. For the purpose of today, uh, we are going to focus in on the CEC Training 1 class. And you can still see as I hover over it, it still says it, even though I renamed it. So I'm going to click on that, and it's going to bring me into my dashboard. So this is where I ultimately want to go, and this is where you might have been dabbling uh, first so when you first got in and learn at home. And if we haven't been using uh, Hapara before, this is a lot of people kind of come here first um, to start some things up. So what am I seeing here? Um, when we set up Hapara at the beginning of each school year, uh, Hapara and PowerSchool, they pull that information together and they actually create folders in the student's Google Drives and shares it automatically with the teacher. Previous to that, a lot of people used to create um, Google Drive folders and share it with their students, and it took a lot of time to do that. Now, Hapara solves that problem. What we're seeing here is any file that is, or any document 
that is in that folder that has been created by Hapara and shared with the teacher. So you can see that uh, I can see up to the most recent three that is in that fo uh, file or folder, I should say. I can do that for, as a teacher. I can say, it is it the most recently five edited uh, files that we have in there? 15, and you can see that it just takes up more real estate on your computer screen. So some people um, typically like it between three and five because what you typically would use this dashboard for is to see the activity that the student is doing. And the activity will always be closer to the top for that student that we're looking at. So you can see that as I just narrow it down a little bit more, that I have three items. And for student six here, this item right here was last updated 20 hours ago and 46 minutes. So if it was something that I was just in the classroom, if we were putting ourselves into uh, a non-virtual learning at home environment and I was coming in and I knew that student had to be working on something that day and it hadn't been touched for three or four days, at least I have a quick little uh, anecdotal to for me to say, okay, I might walk over and touch base with that student uh, today to, to look at that. And if I needed to, I can uh, shift this around and sort them uh, from A to Z and Z to A and so forth. Not too many sort options. We will get into the groups options in just a little bit, but we're going to come back to that as to why we might want to use the groups option. But for now, it's just giving you a quick little overview of what you see on their page. And if you hover over it, like we are seeing some pop-ups already, I can see who is it with, when it's been updated, who's it shared with. And ultimately, if I wanted to uh, click on it, this is my portal right into that document. I can open the document just by clicking on it. And then all of a sudden, I'm right in uh, Google um, environment where I can type on it as the teacher and so forth. So how do I share a document into this folder? I think that's the biggest piece um, that Hapara also solves in terms of a solution before Hapara was we used to share a document and they've the students would file, make a copy, and have to share it back to you. Hapara solves that through the smart share uh, option, which is when I'm at the, the top and I know I'm in the certain class um, that I'm, I'm in, uh, we can always choose a different class during the smart share process, but it's always good to try to set yourself in the class that you want to share that document into. And I'm gonna click on share files. Share files is going to is a way through SmartShare to share files directly into that folder. So why is that a good idea? Because one, uh, you can see activity because it would be in a folder that you we just saw. Um, and two, it helps the student possibly organize themselves um, a little bit easier. Now, is organizing your Google Drive a skill that we can uh, learn and should learn? Of course it is. Um, but sometimes it's just easier to have that file right in the student's folder. And this is what that serves. So. There are a couple options that we have when we are looking at smart sharing and four of them here are creating blank files and sharing them with them. And then the other option is selecting files from your Google Drive. A lot of feedback that we hear from the LT team is that a lot of people like creating their templates, um, their graphic organizers, whatever it is in a very basic format beforehand in their Google Drive and then sharing it through this way. When I, before this, I've gone into my Google Drive and I created a folder and I, I created two uh, files. One is my Learn at Home journal. And it's just a, a simple uh, slide that I used one of the templates and themes for and I called it my journal and I put name. So I just typed in a, a title and a little prompt. And then I, on my second slide, I put in a prompt of date, a text box, and that was already there. And I, I put it one that said add picture here. Then I just duplicated the slide over and over. So this took me about two or three minutes to do. But the purpose is, is that now I can send that out to my class, uh, even in an individual form, so that they can do this by themselves. And I also created a um, Google Doc, just like my reflections on learning virtually. So again, um, this isn't a session about the possibilities of Google Apps for Education and everything that it can do and all the tools that we have in our on our staff portal and in our uh, suite that and, and toolkit that we have, uh, because that would be a very long session. You can even see uh, read and write pop up there. So that is something that is a great toolkit to have. But you can see I just basically put a prompt and a text box and, and that was as um, in depth as I needed to make this for the purpose of today. And it may be just as simple as you need to do for what you, you plan to do with your with your students. So just flipping back to uh, my dashboard, 
I'm going to go to try to find those uh, one of those files um, in my uh, select file smart share. And knowing what you call that Haparo MR, a lot of times it's the most recent file or last modified. By clicking here, you can say, what is it that I need to look for last modified? It might usually pop up. So I tend to go into my Google Drive beforehand just to see it might make sense. And I'm going to click on that file and I'm going to click on my reflection um, or my, I'm gonna, maybe I'll shoot my learn at home journal this time and click select. You can see that it now pops up here and I can select up to five files in this case and, and share it all at once. You can do it individually one by one, uh, depending on who and uh, you wanna share it with, but it does come up with a couple more options to share. And to share this, I have now four options in a Google doc in, in, uh, in my Google drive. I have three options. One is to share it so that they can edit. One is to share it so they can only comment and one is to share it so they can only view and so view only. So you have those three options right here, read and write, read comment and read only. So read and write is edit, read only is just uh, view only and read and comment is your comment piece. But here is copy and I'm gonna keep that on copy. And um, the reason why is when I share this, it's going to automatically send this document or this slides into the students folder for their own copy and so they can start editing it right away. There's no file, make a copy, reshare, type, type your teacher's name in, move forward. There are opportunities to, in the copy feature, append name. So it would say my learn at home journal dash, uh, in this case, it might be student 17 because we have those 20 uh, students in our fake sandbox account at the, at the OCSB level for us. So that might be handy when you're just looking in your Google Drive, but typically it would be in the folder attributed to that student. So it's truly uh, a test out and see if it works for you piece. It, it has been handy when I go into my Google Drive and I'm looking for recently edited piece, but that's what I have dashboard for and that's what I have other tools in the Hapara suite for. So in this case, I can take this uh, uh, item and then share it to my one class. Because it's defaulted to class right now, I can send it to that one class. We'll look at student and groups in just a, a few moments. If, if it was something that I wanted to share to multiple classes, I could go into my other classes and share it. If you're sharing it as a copy, that's great because everybody will still get their individual copy. If you change it to share and read comment or share, read and write, like you wanted to do something in your class and it was just one class, if you share it with multiple classes, all of a sudden you have two classes of students on that document. So just be aware when it's a copy, Usually not a problem because um, it will be it will just be an individual uh, share anyways. So I'm going to remove that second just for timing purposes because if you're given an individual copy, it might take a little longer. And smart share to one class right now. So I'm going to share that, and as it's moving forward, it's going to load in and uh, it will get ready to to share that file with everybody. You can see up here it is moving. Uh, that it is uploading and sometimes it shows at the bottom here which is always changing so we'll we'll keep an eye on that but it does it is uploading and sending that copy to the student files so what does that look like uh for the student and how they get in um they will show you their their view in just a few moments but uh where is this sending it and if i wanted to get off the dashboard where do i see all these uh files if i needed to like for instance what if it's number uh 26 and i cannot get in here past uh and i cannot see it when i'm sorting it past 25 items so if i'm saying 25 items and i want to get to number 26 and and how do i do that um there are options when you click on the three dots to open the folder and that goes directly to that student um, and i can go in that student folder or i can go into the folder that has sort of an umbrella folder so there is a a, a a top folder that houses all these students that you see on the screen. So all the 20 students of your class, you actually have a folder as a teacher. As I mentioned at the beginning of this session, um, the student owns the file and it's shared back with the student. But that happens in this case 20 times. So there's a folder um, that we logged in called CC Training 1 that has student 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through 20 uh, embedded into it. So at this mo moment in time, I'm going to take a few seconds to kind of bypass this dashboard of most recently active, uh, recently edited documents and activity in that folder. And I'm going to jump over to class info because I want to show you how to a couple of ways in which you can get this folder that I'm talking about. In August, when these are populated, it will show up, show up in your shared with me folder um, in your Google Drive. And for teachers, you have to go looking for it at that time. 
You can also search it um, through some of the strategies that we're going to look at right now. So when I click on class info, uh, this is a great area that sometimes people kind of uh, um, haven't gone too far into, and that has some some helpful information that we're going to look at. So in terms of up here, we're going to look around the top. I can see that it's my name. It says language arts, CC training one, and then 1920. I'm going to look at here, it says open class folder. So this is one way, one strategy um, now, or at the beginning of each school year to find out where that class folder is that has been shared with you from Hapara into your shared with me in Google Drive. So when I click on open class folder, I'm going to, uh, wait for Google Drive to load. And when it opens up, you're going to see it's under shared with me, CC training one, and the folder itself right here, there's a couple of things you can do with it right off the bat. And once sometimes people like to just click to add start kind of like we did on our teacher dashboard, because there is a start option on the side here, and it will show up there. When I right click on it, there's an add shortcut to drive. It used to say add to drive. So I am going to add it to drive. And so therefore it will show up when I go onto my main screen. So add show folder to drive and it's going to ask you to choose where. And so now it's my drive. I'm going to click OK, add shortcut. So that's great. What's inside this folder? Um, I will show you and just uh, when I click on it, it is all your 20 students, like I mentioned. The the dashboard is really helpful to see because we don't know when they how what they've edited and what that timeline is. So before we started to go in the student one to check to see if something was moved in and out, in and out, open docs, closed docs. So this is helpful for some circumstances, but the teacher dashboard really helps you in the most cases. The other way to find this folder um, in August or now is to search your drive and just know what that's called. So it's CC training. And then knowing what that is, it might pop up, um, CC training one. And then you can see that I have old folders in there. So again, I'm just looking down here to see if it pops up. So CC training one, and then knowing that it's uh, 1920, you might get that result and there it might pop up. But in, in this case, you're gonna have a lot of pop-ups um, and you're gonna see all the students associated with it. And again, that's just gonna pull it from the shared with me and you can see that i've added the shortcut twice because i did this session yesterday so again i could just right click on it uh, either star it or add it to my drive when i get it to my drive i might have lots of classes um, i might have cc training one a two so some people do like to move these folders into another folder called um, hapara 1920 and then oh and that's okay that doesn't break anything you can definitely uh put your four, five, six, seven, whatever uh, your schedule and your Haparas classes entail into uh, that folder just in, to clean up your main drive page. But that's just how you get to that folder. Um, I'm gonna just jump in quickly to a student view. So this is student uh, 17, um, one of our uh, students that we have in our student of 20 class. And um, you can see that I'm on the portal. So they have the workspace and student dashboard icon but they also have the drive. So this is the K-6 portal. Um, in this case, I'm going to go, they're going to go to their drive and we're going to address the vernacular and the vocabulary on that before, because that's some things that we just need to make sure that the students know where they're going. And in this case, the parents as well, when we say go to your Hapara folder, um, is it on workspace or is it in this folder that we see right now? And you can see that the student didn't have to do anything. CC training one, two, three, and four is already there at the beginning of the year. They did not have to do the strategy that we just did where they had to find it and share it with me because the student is the owner. Now, in this case as well, because they're the owner, they do have some permissions on the folder. So if I right click on the folder and I go to share, just like we would in Google, um, there's ways in which sometimes they could, um, something could happen where the access to the folder gets broken. Um, we usually think it's a glitch in Hapara, but sometimes because they're the owner, um, maybe a name gets accidentally removed, we'll say accidentally, uh, gets removed from the file. Now, how do we fix that as a teacher as well when they're the owner of it? Well, Hapara has thought of that. So I'm going to flip back into a teacher mode and teacher view, I should say, and go back up into my dashboard class info. So when I'm up at the top here and I've the, there's a we think there's an issue and this is uh, one of the 
reasons we get a, some help desk tickets is that um, access to the folder, the, the teacher access to the student's folder is broken. It may be a glitch and maybe for another reason, like I mentioned. So this reset class folders option here is a, a great first step to be able to um, try. Um, it might solve your problem there. So if I click on reset class folder, reset class folders underway, it's as simple as that. Now, people do ask, well, will it take everything out of the folders? No, it's not It's not taking anything that has been uh, in the folder before and removing it. It's just, it's just resetting the link and the sharing between the teacher and the student. And in this case, it's all the class folders. Um, but again, it's not taking it. Sometimes the renaming of something might might happen. Um, but again, none of the uh, none of the files have gone. None of the work is gone. If that's what you're worried about, so that's a great option to click on if you think there is a first step. It's kind of like unplugging or turning off your computer and turning it back on. It's just the first thing that we kind of go to first. Like if there if we hear that there's a permission piece or access of the folder, we say we'll try that. Another piece that we had is um, coming in and trying to make contact with our class. So as we got to learn at home, this was a, also a great strategy to know. Um, a lot of people went into PowerSchool, and that's still an, an option for sure to grab student emails from there. But know that this is always easily accessible and then easily copied um, from if you need to. So we do have the email class function. So if I wanted to email the class something or uh, send them something um, that maybe wasn't in a doc or anything like that, we have this email address right here that is created. Um, it is a Google group um, in the sense that just like at your staff in your school, if you forward something to your staff group, it will it will send that email to everybody on that staff group. So as a teacher, if I send an email to this group, and again, only the teacher and the students can do as part of that group, CC training one 1920 If I click on email class or I copy and paste that, I'm gonna click on email class because we're on it. It's going to open it up in my Gmail, just like a regular email. It's loading in. I'm going to put a subject. I'm going to put um, test email for a session. Two. And then I'm going to put my text or whatever I want to in there. If you have a signature, you can always remove it if you want. And I'm going to click on send. When I click send, that is actually going to send an email to all my students right away, which is great. And uh, this email can also be used. And this is one of the common questions we got for a Google Meet. If you're adding your students into a Meet into the calendar invite, um, again, there's separate uh, support on using that process. But this email can be used in that case where uh, we're looking at for it. So again, just copying and pasting this. Uh, email address into a calendar invite when you're dropping your attendees or invitees into it, that works. This area is also very helpful to know that at the beginning of the school year, there are occasions where there are duplicate names in the system of students. For instance, like John Smith, uh, there might be two John Smiths, so one might be John.Smith1. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to go in and, and look and see what uh, emails are in the class just in case there are any variances that you need to know of instead of just assuming it's first name dot last name at ocsbstudent.ca. Um, so knowing that you can click on these individually and email them. If you wanted to, uh, you could select them all and uh, copy them if you needed to for whatever different things you needed to just be aware that you don't have to type them all out. You could put them into a spreadsheet if you wanted to um, and then you could copy to a clipboard and use them uh, moving forward. So we really like that option in the class info piece as well as we're looking through these uh, processes. So that's a way to email it out. Okay, so we're just going to reset ourselves uh, because we felt that it was needed to see that these folders corresponded to the folders in Google Drive and what does it look like for a student. So I'm going to reset to the dashboard. I said I would come back to the groups option um, on the dashboard before I move on to our other items at the top of the bar here. And you can tell that I'm not going to go in specific order. So in the groups, um, if I uncheck them all, I can always create a new group. And the new group might be um, this group A. Oh, we didn't type. I'll get back in there. It could be a reading level group. It could be just something that you wanted to share with. It doesn't matter. It's totally up to you. And I'm going to click on Add Students. So and today it might be 17. Three and I might not randomly do it, but I would have a purpose in my mind and click on add students. 
And then I'm going to close out and see if it comes in. Under groups, um, I go down and let's see if it populated. I'm going to have to reset on there. Um, this one, 1720, I just created, but it will show up. And if I refresh my screen, it should work. But for the purpose of just the webinar and streamlining our time, I'm going to click on 17 through 20. So how did I do that? Same process, but I grouped them in together uh, for whatever reason that I chose. And now that helps me sort um, my dashboard. Again, if I, if I put on all groups, and I'm going to limit it down again to just three items to make it a little simpler. I can always take and click and drag these items, uh, this card around. You can see that it's willing to move and I can move it over here if I wanted to click and drag them. So you might say, well, Bill, why would I put all that time into creating these groups if it's just for me to look at them on the screen the way it is right now? And you know, it's a valid question and sometimes it's helpful to narrow it down because maybe sometimes when we first came in, uh, and you might be teaching a split class. Uh, it might be something that you have uh, grade four and grade five. So that might be something where you see your grade four and fives. Again, it could be something that where you need to provide uh, digital content um, to uh, students with maybe who have a SIA device um, or the whole class. So the key thing is here in this work, I can definitely sort my viewing of it. So again, it's 17 through 20. That's because I created. But the real, the real sort of plus of this in my mind is if I go into share files again, and uh, in this case, I'm just going to create one of these blank documents. I'm going to look at new drawing. And in this case, what is this? It's actually a completely new drawing. It's going to be blank with a, with a, a webinar title that I give it um, today. And again, same process. I can share it with the class. Why would I want to give a completely blank document and a completely uh, just with a title? Well, one, because uh, if the students are able to, without it being any sort of scaffolding with a graphic organizer or anything, uh, it will end up in their uh, in their folder and they can open it up and then they can uh, make sure that they can access it. So again, here's a copy, but I might share it to a read, uh, a read and write where it's something that I want it to be collaborative. So I mentioned before that I can move from not being sharing it with the class to a specific student, but in this case, I'm gonna choose a group. And in that group, it's going to be group 17 through 20. So I've created that before on my dashboard, and I'm going to share it with the student 17 through 20, and it's going to be share, read, and write. So this is going to be a collaborative document just before between those students that I identified. So a little bit more manageable as opposed to having like 20 people on a doc. So again, I'm going to smart share that to the class. And again, those four options are just quick um, docs or, or slides that are, are sheets that can be shared with your class in a, in a quick moment, it, just with a title and a blank document template, kind of a, a tabula rasa, so to speak. So if you have the students that are able to, to benefit from that and you're just coming back from maybe a, a, a guest speaker or something in the gym that and you want to reflect on it, you can easily just send that something out without a template like I showed you before. So that's the, the benefit for me in terms of uh, the group feature um, that I'm looking at right now. Okay, so I'm going to reset. I'm looking at the time. The next couple of pieces are a little bit quicker because I want to show it, and I definitely want to end up with uh, just kind of saying, "Well, this is a this is this is a lot of information." Right now, we kind of see three, five files in there, and imagine that this is September. Imagine it's your science folder, maybe now, uh, or your class folder, and then imagine it's three months later or seven months later. How big that folder could get of most recently edited activities in terms of organization. Can the student uh, definitely create folders in those folders and separate them? Yeah, there are organization organization points, but there are at some points that we get where I wish there was just a different way that I could organize this or even have the ability to submit them, have the students submit um, their work to let me know that they uh, are done or they need uh, some feedback or something like that. Again, uh, anything in Google still has comment features and different tools. But in terms of what we're looking at right now, that is some feature requests that we get, which then leads us into introducing uh, Workspace in just a little bit. But to quickly go through the top, um, this is an, uh, an elementary view in terms of Gmail. Uh, so I'm going to emphasize that uh, right now, what we're seeing is, again, uh, the emails that have gone into an elementary student's account from uh, the teacher to the student uh, so that they can read them. Again, elementary student accounts are fenced in so that they can't email out 
or be emailed in from somebody outside of our OCSB or OCSB student domains. So these are just emailing emails that have been sent out to those students and um, are, it's just kind of helpful to have sometimes. So test email for session two is what I sent earlier that I tested and sometimes they show up a little darker. It's hard to see on the screen here. And depending on the students that you look at or you have on your screen, they may have, it, it may not have read the email. What this picks up if it's if it's bolded and they're saying well i never got that and we can say that well maybe they did but i will put a little uh hesitancy to that a little caution is that on my phone when i get an email i do get a little pop-up with a little preview of it so it's hard to tell that maybe they actually did see what the content was so just have that air of caution so student 17 over here you can see that these two are definitely a little bit darker than these uh, three, and you can see who the sender was. Um, so Catherine's there and myself here. And I can see that the emails, these two were not read. So it just gives me another point of uh, sending for it. And uh, again, some more options for the students. For the sharing piece, um, this is not something that high school teachers uh, will see, seven to 12. In elementary, uh, you do have some more options to help support the student in learning and organizing themselves as well. And uh, that could be applicable to many, but in a lot of cases uh, right now in K to, K to six, it's something that has been beneficial where you can see a little bit of items outside of that folder. And uh, just in case you're clicking here and you wanna see what it is, that if it's not in the folder and it's been unshared or if it's outside of that folder, um, you might have access to it if you need to. Again, an elementary feature that we look at. Okay, so we've done class info. We've kind of, uh, we've started with our dashboard, just dabbled in Gmail a little bit. And now we're looking at our sharing options. So we're gonna flip over to highlights. This is the last piece in the current dashboard that we're gonna look at before we jump over into kind of just seeing quickly what the workspace is and could offer uh, us moving forward. So this is called highlights and highlights used to be called long time ago, a different tool, but it, it's pretty neat. It's evolved a long way. And as we go in, you can kind of start seeing some items right now. We wanna emphasize that highlights for us is, is is a tool that is meant to streamline, streamline our work. So if I threw out the scenario to you right now, if before um, you maybe knew about highlights and students were just logging into some Chromebooks in their class, how would you get them to a website that you wanted to do if you wanted to send them to like CBC Kids or something like that? Um, you would probably take the link and maybe email it to them. You might uh, do a QR code where you might get them to scan it in. You might do a tiny URL or different type of URL shortener and put it on the board and get them to type it in, which can still be a little bit longer. So this is kind of helpful in the sense that I'm able to uh, one, share links and then also help them with their browsing uh, as well. So we're looking at this tool as a very positive uh, tool that we can use. Uh, some people do see that we are able to see some of the the tabs that are open on the student's uh, Chrome browser at that time. And this is something that we do have access to between uh, eight and four, Monday to Friday um, in the student accounts. So we will talk about the parent piece in just a few moments about we use the student accounts for student learning and that's what we are, are meant to use it for. Um, so we'll kind of show you what we see and what we mean by that. So for student 17 right here, we can see that they're on Google Drive and uh, K to six student portal and my drive. I'm gonna flip over to the student view and you can see that I have the student portal, my drive and so forth. I might open a couple more here. I'm gonna open up, um, let's say maps. I'm gonna open it up, um, Minecraft. And I'm gonna click back onto the student portal. Now I'm gonna flip back to the teacher view and it will refresh. It's not instantaneous, but very already it's starting to do it. You can see that's popped in. So this is what the student currently has open on their uh, browser in their uh, Google uh, Google Drive when logged into their Chrome profile. I'll show, you, I'll show you what that means in just a few moments. So when I look at this as a teacher, I see that they have those five things open and it's highlighted in black under student portal K to six. So I know that that person's currently on that, on that tab and they're not on Minecraft. So immediately I'm looking into my process of, do I say anything, do I not, um, do I leave it be? And if they're not on it, I might walk around the class if I was there uh, at, in, in, in a physical environment and kind of just kind of do my regular strategies. 
There are some things that I could do as well um, if I notice these things. And sometimes we know that we're really good at giving praise and saying, thank, good job, Johnny. I really appreciate how you're working hard when you know that the person might be off on a little uh, tangent as well uh, and kind of praising them, trying to trigger them back into a little prompt into working. So there is this uh, send message feature at the top, and this can be for your whole class, and it could be for an individual student, or again, those groups that we talked about. So it could be, be good job, Johnny. I like how you, you're working so hard on your um, reflection. So I'm going to choose down here and I'm going to click on students, uh, students right now. You can see the other ones are offline because they are, but I see students 17 and 18. I see some other ones that are on there. When I click on student 17, I'm going to send that message. I'm going to flip over to student here and you can see if it will pop up in just a little a moment. I did pop, it popped up on my different screen. So it's hard to see it right at this moment because I have multiple screens going on, but the message did show up on the bottom right corner of that student's uh, screen right now. So it could even be a simple send a message to the whole class. Okay, class is time to tidy up. We're going to close it. And you don't even have to really say or, or kind of break the comm in your class. So I really like that from my st uh, standpoint. You can see student device is not responding as well, which is which is which can be common. Um, so if somebody was logged in at home and then came to school and they had multiple devices, sometimes Hapar doesn't know where to pick that up on. And again, between the times of eight and four, Monday to Friday. So sometimes ref uh, resetting it from the student account is helpful. Um, now I'm flipping to the student again. And at the top, there is an extension at the top. It says it's active. And if you do click on it, there is the option of the student to sort of reset themselves and uh, and for the teacher to then pick it up that they are at that location. So that's a helpful troubleshooting uh, tip as well. Now, what are the other options when I'm in here uh, to look at? Um, share links is pretty cool and, and guide browsing. So again, I'm gonna take this link that I have up here in uh, that I've shared. So maybe it's this one, it was uh, 14 must do uh, tips for cycling season. And this is what I wanted them to get to. And so instead of creating a tiny URL or writing this big ugly URL on the board or you know email it to them or put it on a doc, if they're logged into a Chromebook and logged into Chrome or in their profile and you can see them, you can then share it with, with them so it opens up. So I'm gonna share this link again. It, I can enter, open up 10 up to, uh, at the moment and the class or the student, in this case, I'm just going to choose student 17 again. And the other ones are grayed out because they're not logged in right now at the moment. And then I'm gonna share this link with student 17. So as I flip over to student 17, you can see that now beside Minecraft, this link opened. So this is a benefit of our workflow where if we knew we had some of those Chromebooks open um, and some of those students are were in groups that you needed to as part of your tech station or whatever, this could be done at that moment, which is extremely helpful. Now, the next option here as well is that we can close something if they needed to, but I also caution just, uh, um, is if they're not on it, can I mention to them on at the end of the session? Can I just say, I, I did see you on Minecraft there. I really like how you didn't go on um, or not. If it was something that was really something that needed to be uh, changed or whatever, you could just close it off as the teacher. Again, that relationship between you and the student and them just uh, understanding why this is happening is, is key and a progression of it as well. So the last thing I'm gonna kind of look at is this guide browsing option up top. So in the guide browsing, um, you can set up a focus session or you can set up a filter session. So these are two things that kind of do similar things, but they don't. So the first one here that I'm gonna show you is allow students to access only a few specific websites. So again, you're focusing them by only going them to one area and giving, you might provide a Google doc, you might provide something to read on a website, but that's the only site they're gonna be allowed to potentially go to. Whereas the filter session is gonna allow you to share these sites, kind of like we did with opening the links, but there's gonna be ones that we, we're we not gonna allow them to go to for a student. So again, if Minecraft was a trigger for a student um, and that was an issue for them because they kept on going to going to it, we could set up a filter, but I'm gonna show you that in, as we go to it. So if they clicked on it, they would see it. So set up a focus session, um, you will get this option. And again, I'm just going to uh, put in the same link that we just entertained and I might put, uh, again, copying and pasting from the URLs are fine, but I'm gonna put docs.google.com. I'm gonna put drive.google.com. You might be wanna be more specific or what it is. So where can they go within the links here? And 
can they go to the whole site or only the pages? That's where if you send them to here with the whole site, you're going to be able to go there and allow them to open up different tabs. Um, if you kind of want to narrow them down to just within that environment, like CBC, they can only stay within CBC or that page or in Drive, they can only stay in Drive or Docs. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to do this for 30 minutes. I'm going to keep all the tabs introduced in the session open. So this you can tell that they had open, including Minecraft, different things. And it still might be overwhelming. So I might close that. But when I when it stops this session, I want them to return because students do like that in a lot of cases um, to return. So I'm going to send this again, in this case, just to student 17, but it could be your whole class. I'm going to start the session. And at the top, you can see this student's going to be getting 321. And you might not see the message on the student end of things. It's showing up on my uh, other screen that I have open now. It'll say uh, it will begin shortly. So there is a 10 second countdown for the students to be aware. Again, if you're uh, present in class, you can say this is going to happen or you can tap them on the shoulder. So you're going to see some things happening right now where it's removing the ones that uh, because I put on that option to remove what's currently open and then keep the three things that I have. Um, open, you can see that it is loading right now. So drive docs.google.com and that article about 14 must do's for cycling. And if I will go to open up a new tab, uh, because I've done those sessions and I want to click on something else, if they want to go to Minecraft, we're going to see um, right now that uh, it does pop it in there and does it does prompt them to go back only into those sessions. You might get different uh, options to uh, to look at in terms of this is the Minecraft one. Are you in the right place? It's going to be going, uh, it's not going to allow me to get in it. So sometimes it's say your focus browse, kind of get that message, you're stopping and it won't work. Um, so same thing, it's kind of like I opened up, I shared the links, uh, but in this case, I also restricted them from going somewhere else potentially, or I kept them specifically in that environment. So in, I'm just going to release that students or all the students. So to reset that focus browsing, so you can do it by one or all, and all these student, um, Pages are coming back, which they do like, because if you caught them off guard, they don't want, they like kind of having their items back to normal. And in guided browsing, in guide browsing, you do have the setup of filter session. So I did set up a, tem a template. So you can do this ahead of time, which is great. Uh, you can do that over here as well. When you do create it at the bottom left of that screen, you can uh, save that template. So again, you're not, you don't always have to be in the moment uh, doing it. So I'm going to review it. And here, it's a bit different because I put some in here um, where I'm going to just put that I don't want you to access drive.google.com in this case. So in drive.google.com, um, in that moment, maybe I put a, a form out and I don't want them to use the resource. I just want them stuck to the form. So in this case, uh, I'm going to start the session for the students or the class. Again, in this case, just for it could be student 17. It could be all the ones that are logged in won't be able to visit that. So if I'm sitting here and that's the Minecraft, uh, it could be that one. So it didn't change anything up here. It's basically just a fail safe for somebody that maybe, uh, may, so I'm gonna go to drive.google and I'm gonna click on that, whoops. When I go in there, it's going, oh, I didn't put it in my top, sorry. searched so because i typed in there it does say are you in the right place for learning so if i if the student wanted to go to minecraft it will say are you in the right place for learning so that was because i used at the teacher level the guide browsing filtering so it wasn't the student really wasn't aware of anything until they went to that place where they maybe um where it was going to pause it, uh, pose a distraction, or you could use it where I really didn't want them to access a resource or something from that piece. So maybe you only you shared with them a um, a form, and that can be done in the other format as well. But there's so many options right now to see as you go as you go through. These are just some ideas that um, are on this this tool right now. So I'm going to release all the students. I'm going to reset ourselves a little bit where. Uh, we've gone through a quick snapshot of all the things that we have here from the dashboard to the class info, Gmail, and sharing quickly, and now highlights. The possibilities are still there through Activity Viewer and the current screen and snaps. Um, but again, we can follow up with that with our, with our consultant team and support that way. Um, so again, I'm going to go back to that prompt as to where... Um, if, if this becomes so big in terms of my dashboard, I have all these items where 
it's just I want to know they're submitting. I know I know they're completing work. I want it maybe packaged into a theme or something where if I'm doing something on human organ systems and I want something about the lungs or the nervous system, um, it's all going to be jumbled in here in terms of a resource. So that's where workspace kind of comes in handy. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it today, but I want to show you just what it means to get there and why you might want to use it before we kind of summarize our session today and answer some questions. So when I go into here, I've already created this for the purpose of today because next week we will have workspace sessions on it to itself and it will go through all these things that you're seeing. Um, when I click on webinar test, um, that's what I called it. You can call it anything that makes sense to you for your task. When it loads in, it just gives you some different what we call cards. Well, you can see create a card, create a card, and it gives you some columns, which can be uh, renamed if you need to for, but typically goals, resources, evidence, because the student might, uh, they would submit their work in here and uh, uh, and then rubrics. And now rubrics is, is something, did you want to put an anchor chart? Did you want to put something in there? There are different ways in which you can call this as well. If I don't put anything in this column or in this column uh, or columns that I don't put anything into at all, they will um, not show up on the student view. So if I only put something in the evidence column, they get one card, um, one column. And if I put these two, they would see that. So you can see that I took some of those same things, like the 14 must do's thing. So all I did was I uh, created a card. I put the link in there. And in some websites, it does populate the picture. Some people are inquiring about how do you add pictures or, or create them and put them in. That will be on next week's session. So please join. And then here, I um, added the students in um, through students in groups. And that will be on next week's session where I, um, I share it with them by adding kind of like smart sharing, but this is a card within workspace under evidence. I shared it with all my students and now I sent it as a copy, just like I would in smart share. I can see that one student has started it and that's student 17. So I can hover over it and I can go into it um, just like I would in the dashboard. Um, and now I can see in that moment what they've done or uh, hovered over again on the previous page. So I can see that in this case, um, they have done a, a, a posting, so it's Friday, May 22nd, and they go, oh, that's great. They've already done it this morning. It's only 10.50, and they're reflecting on their day, so maybe they should have put Thursday, May 21st or something like that. But it's a great day. It's your birthday, pizza and friends, and so forth. So you can do a comment just like you would in Google, uh, maybe a voice note or anything like that. So in here, I'm just hovering over and getting the same information on when it was last updated, and they can submit it from their end, and it would come into a column in here, which also triggers you in terms of uh, a teacher. So there's lots of possibilities in workspace and there's lots of possibilities in uh, Hapara and teacher dashboards. So again, we'll always emphasize there's not one way to use it. There's a million ways to use it. it depends on how you wanna use it and what your end goal is. So for workspace, we'll kind of dig into some experiences we have next week um, with that tool. And we hope you can join from that standpoint as well. And we will record that one if you can't. So I'm gonna reset to my slide deck. Um, the webinar and just kind of move through a couple slides because we've addressed a lot of those ones. But I want to touch on the parent support piece um, just quickly. And I do want to kind of look at that. I mentioned the vernacular and terminology between Google Drive folder and Hapara workspace. Um, for the students, the Google Drive folder um, is just a Google Drive folder. The teacher puts it uh, an item or a task into that folder based on using SmartShare, but typically it doesn't mean a lot in terms of Hapara for their student. Uh, we talk about it in class, so it's good for them to know, um, but it's good to say in your Hapara Google Drive folder. If we say Hapara folder, it could be in workspace. So some parents and students are getting confused um, in the initial part of Learn at Home and throughout the year, and then workspace. Chrome Profiles is another one that we get a lot of uh, interest and questions about, because if I go to uh, google.ca, you will see that I am logged in. And again, this is not for a Chromebook. If I'm on a PC or a Mac, there's in my Chrome browser, I'm logged in here under my OCSB account and add another account. We find a lot of people are kind of flipping in and out on emails and drives here, which can cause a lot of conflict when students are using uh, softwares and links off the student portal that requires their OCSB student.ca email for single sign on, including Hapara and logging in. And as part of that piece with the highlights, it's also good to separate the accounts like we're doing. So there's a video on OCSB how to on keeping those profiles separate. And here, if I click on this, I can actually scroll down and add another guest. 
So in case of student 17, I already clicked on student 17 here, and you can see maybe I'll open up our learning tech account. It's actually gonna open up a third tab at the bottom and keep things separate. So I haven't logged in and out of my accounts. I've kept browsers separate. So that is a good uh, tip and trick to uh, look at as well. And then one last piece, I think, sorry, wrong slide, is student view and the playlist. So we're gonna quickly go through um, these items for support. So please join us on our OCSB how-to uh, playlist for more information. We have a help desk ticket for anything technical support. We have our consultants like we've already introduced for each family school, so please follow up with us. And the Hapara sites here uh, as well. So um, as we move forward, again, here's our awesome LT team that we are looking forward to following up with you. Those are the families of schools, so please feel free to reach out for us. It can be individual or we can set something up with you and your colleagues at a time. And of course, the certifications we have a lot of interest on. Um, so Hapara does run their certification program. Please check out those links on educator and scholar. Um, we also have the, because being a good partner with Hapara, we are very interested in um, making sure that we can take these, um, these tools and then maybe OCSBify them. And so we run a program through Leading and Learning and we might have one coming up and we regularly do through these journeys. So please keep your ears and eyes out for more information on those as well. Um, it's a great way to connect deep learning and our board priorities and tools specifically into that certification. All right, so a little bit longer than anticipated. Sorry, sorry team, but uh, we will go through uh, and answer any questions that you do have. So Catherine, are you coming in? Yeah, I'm gonna come in. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. So we did have a few questions come in, which is amazing. Um, so the first one being, if you're a teacher and you are sharing files through the SmartShare, how would you guide your students in where to find those documents? So we saw from the teacher perspective what it looks like, but for a student who receives a document through SmartShare, what does it look for them and how can the teacher support them in finding that in their drive? Perfect. So yeah, um, I'm for a student when they want to go in, the key thing is that they would enter in through their Google Drive off the uh, student portal. And so the student portals for them can be found uh, through their school websites and so forth, but it should pop up when they do log into their accounts, especially uh, when they get into Chrome. And by clicking on Google Drive, they should log into the main page of Google Drive and see the classes laid out as uh, they've already been shared um, and created from Hapara. And so when they click into that folder, so if you tell, uh, if you mention to a student that you've shared it to their language arts folder in Google Drive, they'd be able to click in and see a folder that's it's already in there. So it has been shared with them, but it's also already in that folder. Perfect, exactly. So the student has one folder for every class that they're registered for in PowerSchool. And uh, through the powers that be in HAPRA, if the teacher already shares it out, it's already yeah. in that folder. So. Um, it's done for them. The student just has to go and look for that class folder. That's right. Okay. Um, when creating groups of students, can I edit those groups? Even if I have already begun sharing documents to those groups, can I edit them afterwards? For sure, you can definitely uh, edit groups as you go through because students may move in. If, if it was a reading level, then you might move them in and out. So definitely the flexibility of the groups that you've already um, created can be moved in and out. Sometimes when you have the students, uh, if it won't change the past documents that you've already shared with those groups, so it's not retroactive, but in terms of moving to the future, you can definitely go in and click edit. Instead of creating new group, you could edit the group that you've already created, move a student in and out just by clicking the check marks um, as you go. Awesome. Next question. Uh, will the board be get, giving us the ability to add teachers to our dashboard, not workspace? Some of our staff uses the dashboard more than workspace and wants to add EAs. So I think, you know, this question is talking about um, for EAs, I mean, if they're individually emailing certain students, then they could just email them, right? I think more of the smart share that you were talking about was more how to send sort of mass group documents to groups of students. Um, but you can elaborate a little bit further on why you might in that scenario want to move to workspace and not add a, well, there's no ability, but you can touch on that. 
Yeah, I think that it all depends on what we're trying to get to the students because we're not trying to preempt the collaboration between all the, the educators in the classroom. So if it's a doc that needs to be shared out, that can be collaborated with um, from anybody, any party because that's just Google. Um, so if it's myself and my EA and, and a resource partner, um, we can create that template and, and just have the teacher quickly share it. Anything in Google, we have found a lot of people that go to those folders that we've already shared and share that specific folder with the student that that EA may work with uh, closely. So then it's a collaboration between the uh, teacher pushing it out and the student and, uh, and the EA in this case, um, accessing the, the documents in Google just by sharing the folder. Um, and then uh, in we've had some different circumstances during the learn at home time because of uh, trying to access students. But typically on a, a school year, a lot of those are suffice um, to uh, solutions is how do we collaborate beforehand, share it out. And then once it's shared into the student's folder, it's just Google sharing. That whole folder could be shared with the uh, with the EA or the whole class folder could be shared with the EA as well. So there are lots of workarounds on that. Exactly. And just to confirm, because I just want to make sure that I'm saying the right message as well, there's no ability to add a co-teacher into the dashboard. Yeah, not into the dashboard. It would have to be filtering and, and coming from the feed file in PowerSchool um, right now, yes. Yeah, exactly, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, so either workspace or sharing the individual folders, or actually if the EA is only working with a few students or one student, then they can just share that document via Gmail. They don't yeah. have to even go through that short. Okay, cool. Next question. Um, how can students submit their work or put their work into their folders? Perfect, that's an excellent question. So what, um, in Google, uh, the best way is to uh, try to get a, a template sent into those HAPAR folders in the first place. But there is some navigating in the, the student any things where you can click and drag uh, any files that they make in Google Drive and drag it right into that folder that has been created. So if it's a language folder and the student actually accidentally created a document outside of that folder by clicking new and then uh, showing that, they can uh, move that into the folder that is created. It's kind of like a Dropbox um, that they're able to use. So as long as that that file or that document ends up in that folder, it can be clicked and dragged, or it can be um, right clicked on and moved uh, manually uh, through that student end of things. Perfect, right? exactly what you said. Um, students can't technically submit a Google Doc, right? Anything, yeah. if you ever hear that language on Twitter or something, um, they're referring to workspace. There is the ability for a student to submit a card, but the wonderful thing about Google is that you as the teacher, because you have access to HAPR, can just log in to any student's piece of work uh, and see the most recent up-to-date. So there's no real need for them to submit because you're sort of a live uh, collaborator on that document and you can see it. So that also sort of points to the benefit of using HAPR in the first place, is that if you're using SmartShare or if you're using Workspace, there's no need for students to put their work into folders because it automatically goes into folders and it removes that barrier altogether for students accessing their work. Yeah, and a lot of people, they um, they kind of jump into Dashboard, um, first of all, and then as they use it and use it and use it, they hit a point where they ask that exact question, how can I submit it? Um, and then how can I organize it better? And when if you're kind of asking yourself those questions, then we can say, well, I think workspace is it's timely for to be able to use something uh, like workspace. Yep. Um, and last question, I get sometimes that students can't access their specific folders. So if a student is reporting that they can't see their folder, what would be the proper steps for the teacher to take? Um, from the tech end, there's always so many variables that go into it. So the first one would be I always I would always try uh, resetting the class folders. Um, mm -hmm. that is, that's our default for sure. Um, if we've gone through and we are, it's truly is it's not there. Definitely put in a help desk ticket so we can help support you uh, better from that end. So we can kind of look go through our steps and uh, and triage it to, to make sure we can serve you the best. Awesome. So those are all the questions. So I'm now going to throw it over to Audra, uh, who will sort of close it all up. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Bill. That was awesome. It's so nice to kind of get a refresher on Hapara over and over again. Um, and it's such a wonderful tool. I know that when I was in the classroom, I used it all the time and all the different features have such a different place um, in our different classrooms. So um, thanks for sharing all the little bits and bits and bobs and little tricks. I know the reset class folders was always a lifesaver when when things kind of wonky. So that's a that's a great point to kind of wrap up on. 
Um, as always, if you have any questions, everybody out there, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're your K-12 consultants, so regardless of whether you teach kindergarten or grade 12, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we are more than happy to answer your emails um, and questions with getting started with Apara. So thanks for joining us today. And thanks, Bill. Yeah, Great thanks job. so much, Audra. And thanks so much, Catherine. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time to, to join us today. Again, with your busy schedule under Learning Stance, we always appreciate it. We work for an awesome, awesome board. So thanks, everybody. And here's just the promo for next week's um, Digging Deeper into Helpara Workspace. We'll have our consultant team. We'll have some uh, colleagues who've gone through the certification process from the system joining us for that. So we'll have some examples from their classroom experience as well. And you can find all that information on the OCSB professional learning site um, and access it that way. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody then. So thanks everybody.